Coming up on Market to Market, the president drops off some late winter reading for Congress. The Agriculture Committee throws a bucket full at McCarthy over WOTUS. And new mining prospects dig up old pollution fears. Those stories and market analysis with Angie Setzer next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, February 12 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Despite falling stock prices, Americans took advantage of sub-$2 gas and slightly higher wages to part with more of their disposable income. According to the Commerce Department, retail sales rose two-tenths of a percent in January. When volatile factors are taken out, retail sales rose four-tenths of a percent. After two consecutive years of massive declines, net farm income is forecast to be down a scant 3% to $54.8 billion this year. And OPEC may honor a request from Russia to reduce crude oil pumping in light of prices losing nearly 18% over the last two weeks. The rumor helped push the market back over $29 at the end of the week. The latest slump reflects heightened concerns that global economic growth is slowing. Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen reiterated her confidence in the U.S. economy in front of the Senate Banking Committee this week. And EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy testified before the Full House Agriculture Committee to answer questions on everything from the renewable fuel standard to the waters of the U.S. statutes. The discussion was decidedly civil. McCarthy also answered one of the big questions with WOTUS concerning water, permits, and agriculture. But in terms of the agriculture community, there is no added permit burden. Unequivocally, I can go None. back to every one of my producers and say, the way you're doing things now, if you were up to standards, nothing changes. That's correct. But activities on the Hill started the week with the delivery of some late winter reading. Paul Yeager reports. President Obama submitted his last budget to Congress this week. The $4.1 trillion package of spending arrived on Capitol Hill, featuring liberal policy initiatives and tax hikes. Health and Human Services, Defense, Treasury and Social Security make up more than three quarters of all government spending. However, most departments are slated for increases. Four agencies are tabbed to receive less funding in 2017. The budget for the Department of Agriculture is scheduled to receive $155.4 billion, a decrease of 5.3 percent from last year. USDA makes up only 3.7 percent of the entire federal budget. Obama earmarked $12 billion over 10 years to help feed school children from low-income families in the summer. Currently, 22 million students receive free or reduced-price meals during the school year. Other winners appear to be an investment in new farmers and agriculture research. USDA is looking to collect more data on antibiotic use in poultry and livestock in an attempt to fight increases in resistant bacteria. Bird flu decimated flocks in several U.S. states in 2015. Now $27 million is being set aside for the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to improve response to outbreaks like that one. Crop insurance took a hit in the president's budget and will struggle to find support on being included in the final ledger again in 2017. Previous attempts at reductions have failed. House Agriculture Committee Chairman Mike Conaway dismissed the Obama budget as being out of touch with those working in rural America. He encouraged the president to stop high foreign subsidies and costly rules like EPA's waters of the U.S. regulations. Overall, the budget calls for a tax increase of $2.6 trillion over the next decade, double what the president asked for in 2016. One way proposed to achieve that goal would be to impose a $10 per barrel tax on crude oil. 
The revenue would be used on alternative transportation program as part of the White House's plan to deal with global climate change. Many GOP lawmakers say that idea has virtually no chance of winning congressional support. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Funding for federal agencies is an ongoing battle. Many cash-strapped departments cover multiple initiatives, and that includes policing a large number of stakeholders with a smaller force. A case in point is the mining industry. The EPA is charged with tracking pollution at more than 13,600 active mines, as well as monitoring an estimated half million abandoned sites. More than one town has watched ore pulled out of the ground, piles of waste rock grow, water become polluted, and mines close. However, there are communities where worry over history repeating itself is set beside economic revitalization and mining companies that must comply with strict environmental rules. Josh Bittner explains. It's crazy to clean the river only to allow it to be polluted again. And that's exactly what Polymet plans. Last fall, demonstrators pressured Minnesota's St. Louis County Board to publicly acknowledge a proposed copper-nickel sulfide mine would threaten the health of their local watershed. Mining is less than 1% of Minnesota's economy. Does it make sense for us to allow Polymet to open up their sulfide mining operation and destroy or isolate over 1,000 acres of wetlands for an industry that contributes so little to our economic well-being. This river has been designated as one of the top 10 most endangered rivers in the United States. That's, that's not a good thing. Opponents allege newly unearthed sulfur-bearing rock will create acid mine drainage, diluting previous efforts to restore the St. Louis River, a waterway once crippled by iron ore pollution. Those are established, the, 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 essentially the landscape has been damaged already. Um, they're slowly coming up to speed with their permits, but they're getting there. Uh, the sulfide mining is a whole new thing. Since 2008, applications to conduct exploratory drilling have surged in the land of 10,000 lakes. And Toronto, Canada-based Polymet Mining Corporation is first in line to unlock precious metals from the Duluth complex, a vast mineral deposit in the arrowhead of Minnesota. Mining proponents say geologists have known about the formation for over 60 years, but new technology has eliminated barriers to excavation of 4 billion tons of raw material, worth an estimated $1 trillion. Because we're using a legacy site, we'll actually be able to clean up some of the issues that are currently going on and bring modern um, technology to the process. Corporate officials say any water released from their proposed NorthMet site will be treated to meet state and federal guidelines. But for some, the mining industry's past practices fan the flames of skepticism. Environmental regulations didn't exist when Minnesota broke ground on iron ore mines 130 years ago. And while time has offered the benefit of a more enlightened geological approach, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which monitors mining, was only created in 1970. A well-established hub for agriculture, forestry, and mining exports, the Port of Duluth sits between the contested estuary and Lake Superior. Taconite, a finite resource used to make steel, is mined exclusively in the state's Masabi Iron Range. Ships from North America's furthest inland port have traditionally transported the commodity to mills around the Great Lakes Rust Belt and the world. In decades past, however, Two nearby locations became so polluted, they qualified for EPA's Superfund program. As corporate and taxpayer-funded cleanup continues, some stakeholders fear relapse. It's been proven that we can meet um, water quality standards, both surface and groundwater, here at the site. Um, if we can't show that through environmental review and permitting, we won't get a permit to operate. Polymet expects to produce 3.6 billion pounds of copper equivalent over 20 years. At 32,000 tons of ore per day, that's a fraction of the 100,000 tons of taconite that once rolled through daily. 
but the bounty on precious metals far outweighs that of low-grade ores, while its leftovers raise red flags to critics. This is an example of taconite tailings. Our tailings will look very similar, um, where the copper, nickel, platinum, palladium, gold um, metals have been recovered, and basically washed sand is what's left. During a decade-long process, Polymet has jumped through various state and federal hoops, described as the most stringent in the world. Project backers say copper and nickel, chief components in cell phones, hybrid car batteries, solar panels, and wind turbines are essential building blocks for a high-tech, clean energy future. A future some say the U.S. should secure now, before less climate-minded competitors, like China, are allowed to dominate the market. Minnesota's laws are the strictest in the country when it comes to, to, to the to environment. And, uh, and plus, we live here, you know, we live here, we play here, we drink the water, we, we, we breathe the air. We want this, we want this to be done right, and it, and it will be done right. A portion of Minnesota's taconite production tax funds the Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation Board, an economic development agency charged with diversifying northeastern Minnesota's economy. In its early years, the board was instrumental in taconite's rise as an alternative to depleted natural ores. Current members view copper nickel mines as a natural progression, and Polymet predicts roughly 1,000 direct and indirect jobs would result from its project, a forecast welcomed with open arms by some in a region sapped by economic slump. My main focus is making sure that the wild rice is protected. And we need to understand that without water, there will be no life, including human life. Adding to layers of complexity, the North Met mine sits within territory ceded to the government by Native Americans. In 1854, the Lake Superior Chippewa entered into a treaty giving the U.S. ownership of their lands in exchange for hunting, fishing, and wild rice harvest rights in perpetuity. Wild rice is sacred to area tribes and protected by law. Minnesota is the only state in the nation with regulations in place to limit the amount of sulfate, another mining byproduct, in waters where the caviar of grains is grown. Polymet is confident it will meet standards for wild rice, but ultimate approval of the North Met mine rests with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and a decision is expected soon. You worry about the water, you worry about the rice, but you also worry about the jobs and the industries, and there has to be some kind of happy medium there. The Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa says 2015's final environmental impact statement is flawed. The tribe conducted inquiries of its own, which they say contradict state and federal findings. And while critical of the North Met project, officially, the Fond du Lac Band does not oppose regulation-driven mining aimed at reducing environmental damage to the maximum extent possible. There's a lot of misinformation on our project. Um, it's easy to have sound bites in opposition, but it takes a long time to be able to explain exactly what we are and what we aren't doing. Even though various national authorities have given the go-ahead, those opposed say corporate profits and tax revenues are the only thing Polymet will dig up. Protect, don't pollute. Protect. And the battle over risks and benefits will likely continue as rivals work their way through the scrutiny of precious metals development up north. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. The release of the February WASDE report ended up being a non-event. With burgeoning world stocks and a weakening dollar, the grain market slid lower. For the week, March wheat lost nine cents, while the nearby corn contract fell seven cents. A brief shift in orders to U.S. ports produced a flurry of activity, but South American prices calmed things down as the March soybean contract gained five cents. March meal went against the grain and dropped three dollars per ton. In the softs, March cotton lost a dollar seven per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, March class three milk futures rose ten cents. A limit down move earlier in the week pressured cattle lower as the April cattle contract lost five twenty seven. March feeders fell $3.80, and the April lean hog contract rose $0.08. Cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index dropped 
Crude oil strengthened after hitting 13-year lows early in the week as the March contract declined $1.45 per barrel. COMEX Gold gained 81.70 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell 4.5 points to settle at 285.35. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is our newest market analyst, Angie Setzer. Angie, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, and we are excited to have you. We have a, uh, an interesting week this week yeah. in the commodity markets, and I want to start talking about the wheat market. We're off $0.09 cents in the nearby. And we've got a question from one of our viewers. This is from Jay in East Moline. He wonders, soft red winter wheat hasn't had much snow cover, and now we're getting cold temperatures. Is this a threat to the crop? Right now, most people will tell you that this, this coming cold blast is not going to be cold enough to, to really cause some significant damage. The funny part with wheat, though, is that you can look out and think that something's not causing damage, and it very well may be. Um, we're seeing similar things, Russia, Ukraine, you know, everyone's saying, hey, temperatures aren't cold enough, problems aren't big enough to be concerned, but it is something that I'm concerned with as well, okay. just because for the bulk of the winter now, we've seen temperatures above normal, um, snow cover very limited, a lot of moisture, different things of that nature, so I am a little bit hesitant to uh, dive in head first on the, the cash market setting basis for my elevator sales at this point for new crop just because I want to see how she comes out of it. You know, once we get into May and, and get a good feel for, for what we've seen, then I'll, I'll be a little bit more comfortable. Okay. But with wheat, we tend to, you know, at least kill the crop, whether it's real or imagined, two or three times a winter. And uh, so it is something that we'll definitely want to keep an eye on. Now, that being said, between a much lower dollar mm -hmm. week over week and even the idea that this cold weather could be enough to hurt it in places, is there any reason for wheat to move up here in this next week? Simply because we're trading towards multi-year lows would be about the only thing. We saw a pretty substantial increase in uh, commercial or the spec shorts uh, that you saw. Um, so we're, the wheat short is growing, okay. um, and I, I hate to be, I hate when I hear the only reason the market should rally is for short covering, but the last time we got down around this level, we did see some short covering, some buying come in, um, and the wheat market is good at, at doing that, trading its range. We're on the low end of the range. You know, if we do see some more talk kind of develop with the issues in, in Russia, Ukraine, uh, perhaps some of that soft red wheat belt that we're seeing, we could see it kind of pop back up. But Three or 470, 475 Yeah, in the 475, 482 on the front month for, for uh, the Chicago wheat mm -hmm. seems to have been the recent high end where the market likes to trade up, okay. make you feel like it's going to trade higher, and then usually give up the ghost. So okay. it's really going to be one of those things that we have to keep an eye on, of course. But at the same time, we have that giant wet blanket that is record global stocks. Global stocks. And now as we take a look at the corn market, we saw U.S. stocks increase in the mm -hmm. February WASD report. Corn dropped slightly, maybe some dollar weakness supporting it there. Yeah. Where's this old crop corn market going in the near term? It, it's running to standstill. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, old crop corn at this point in time for the next six weeks really isn't going to get a shot of any sort of new information. Now, if we were to see the dollar kind of, we did see the dollar recover a bit today, Friday, um, a little bit with the jobs, the jobs number from yesterday and then the retail sales, of course, coming in a little bit better, helped to kind of get some support under the dollar after falling to multi-month lows. Um, if we could see crude kind of follow through on the gains that we saw here today as well, um, perhaps then we could see some, some of that carryover go into corn and see it trade back up towards the high end of its range. We need some sort of new information. So okay. if we can get to where we're seeing some export sales announcements, perhaps every day, you know, every day is way wishful thinking, but a couple times a week, get some solid export inspections, some solid sales, um, then you could see maybe the corn market get some, some pop underneath it. But really when it comes down to it until March 31st, mm -hmm. March 30th, for the USDA quarterly stocks and acreage report, there isn't any new information. Even with the supply and demand report next month, you know, the, the second week of the month there, all you're likely to see in that is a, another cut to exports due to the fact that we're still 25, 26% behind a year ago, and the USDA is only anticipating a 10, tell, okay. you know, 10, 11% decline. So new crop, not a lot of incentive to make any sales in here at these levels. No, not Old at this crop, point. do you pull the trigger given that the sentiment is to the downside? It depends on where you're at from a cash flow and what you're seeing local basis. 
Um, in the eastern Corn Belt, the good weather and uh, the the need to move ahead of weight restrictions. In, in my home state uh, of Michigan, we have frost laws, or what they're called. So you you have to move grain prior to those kicking in, or you're not moving it until they're they're lifted. So we have seen an increase in, in recent sales. Uh, decent basis levels have encouraged that as well. Okay. Um, we've heard rumblings in Indiana, Ohio. You've seen some ethanol plants cutting back on ours. Mostly, of course, because of the, the excess ethanol, we do have record yes. ethanol stocks. So that is something that is, is kind of limiting Another production. Another concerning factor. Um, but you've seen so many farmers moving grain. So some of that basis is weakened. You are seeing some strength in the Western Belt, depending on where you're at. Mm -hmm. It's all so local. Um, but if you can take advantage of good basis and you need to move grain from a cash flow standpoint, look at, at probably doing so, especially if you can get a pop where we get four or five cents to the upside. All right. Now, as we take a look at the soybean market up on the week, yeah. beans the only green on my little board here. Yeah. Can we carry this strength forward into next week? I <laughs> wish I could say yes. I And we could. I mean, it's it, the, the high side of the soybean market's been that 885, 888 on the march. Um, we are seeing some strength kind of come back into that March May spread. There is some talk that processors aren't necessarily completely covered on what they need to be, you know, much beyond two or three weeks out. Um, however, you do have a, a harvest pace in South America that is beginning to ramp up. Um, there's some very active sales going on down there. Uh, so any sort of significant rally that you see in the market is probably going to be met with some substantial farmer selling both here and in South America. Okay. Um, so that is going to kind of lid, put a lid on some things. So a rally here probably meant to be sold, especially yes. on the old crop side. Yeah, a rally here on the old crop side is definitely meant to be sold. And if we can get back up into that $9 future range for new crop, I would look at selling it. Okay. Um, Long-term soybeans kind of, they, they I don't want to say they scare me, but it's very difficult to, to come up with some sort of story that's going to give you any sort of move to uh, a much higher level than what we've seen. A lot of bearish fundamentals. Yes, prior to August or September, unfortunately, because that's when our, our key production time period comes. Okay. Well, now, as we take a look down at the livestock markets, we did see live cattle drop another $5.30 this week. Are we getting close to putting in a low, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, I think cattle, when it comes down to it, is, is range-bound. I think you could look back through, and, and I, I hate to sound like a broken record in this, but when it comes down to what you've got from an overall commodity market sentiment, what you've got happening with the dollar, what we have happening with, you know, slower than what we'd like to see exports. Now, we have seen over the last couple months on the cattle side, exports have outweighed imports, which is a great that's, First that's what time we want in to see. Two years. It's been quite some time, so that that is good. Um, but when it comes down to it, I think what you're going to start to see on the cattle side is the futures market may become a bit more detached from your cash. Um, you may see some more divergence just because you have some areas that have, have had good conditions that are going to be bringing cattle to market. Your southern plains, you know, they're starting to get into calving. Things look really good. Um, but then you have up here, you know, in the, the Iowa area and to the north where uh, we've had two blizzards in two weeks. Uh, we have another snow event coming. We're, we're going to get really cold before we warm up. Um, so your cash cattle movement may be a, a whole lot different or separated quite a bit from what you're seeing on the future side, which makes it even more difficult from a risk management right. standpoint, unfortunately. Um, but it goes back to just like how you trade in grains. You've got to know what your local market setup is and take advantage of it accordingly, you know, as best you can. As best you can. Now on the feeder cattle side, down again this week. I believe we're a month in a row on the downside yeah. on a weekly chart basis. Are we going to find some upside here as we work into the spring? I think we could potentially. Um, you know, the feeder cattle side is difficult just because I think we're still... Um, reeling from the last cattle on feed report that we had, which was a little bit surprising. Um, you know, overall, was it horrendously negative? I guess that's up to each to each their own on the opinion side. Um, but when it comes down to it, it does appear as though we do have some more cattle out there than what we would anticipate. You know, your cattle on feed numbers could be considered somewhat bearish from an overall supply standpoint, and that's not even counting the bulk of the 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 cows that are out there, right. or the cattle that are out there. So, um, you know, you have seen your increase in, in heifers, of course, which will, will bring in some more supply as we go forward, mm -hmm. or, or should, uh, whether that's through new additional uh, cattle coming 
I guess right. you say calves. online. Yeah, yeah. fresh calves. Yeah. Um, or through them being called eventually or brought into the, the market yeah, that direction. That direction. So you just got to kind of keep an eye on it. I think we're still going to be range bound. Uh, it's the hardest part in the world is that you have a very thin trade, which makes for a very volatile trade. Um, and again, you're going to go probably go back to your local market structure as more of a, a leader or more of a determining factor on how you proceed okay. versus what the actual futures are trading. Gotcha. Now let's take a look at the lean hogs. And I lied, beans weren't the only thing in green. Lean hogs up eight cents on the week. Yeah. Surprising strength given the number of uh, the amount of pork out there. Can this continue? I I think hogs are really, I think it's because they've been down. They've kind of been beaten down here over the last couple of weeks from um, what I've seen out of the peripheral. And so when it comes down to it, I, I think you still have a significant supply. You haven't really seen the cutback in that. Um, we haven't really seen a significant increase on the export side either. So any strength in hogs is, is kind of one of those things where it's almost like strength in the crude market where, you know, do you buy the dips or do you sell the rips? And when it comes to hogs at this point in time, I'd probably lean more towards the latter than the former. Okay, just getting out. We're at higher levels than we've seen in a while. Yeah, but again, it goes back to, you know, you've got to know your local, what you're dealing with locally, what you have going on there, but just have a general understanding from the hog side that we have significant supply, reasonably okay. significant supply, and the likelihood of us seeing anything strongly fundamental to change that um, is probably pretty limited as we go forward. All right, Angie, before we let you go, does crude end this next week higher or lower than $30? Ooh, that's a fun one. That's what, can I take a push? I think, <laughs> you think that's what, relative mid stability. range, yeah. I think we're gonna start to see some, some stability in crude right now. Um, I worry that today's strength is gonna be offset when we come back on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, any sort of OPEC rumor, you know, this, why is this one more uh, valid than the, the last 20? Volatility, we'll so, talk about that more in the Market Plus. Yeah. Angie, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but Angie and I will continue that discussion and answer more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available on our website. Remember to submit your in inquiries, inquiries for our analysts each week via our Twitter handle at Market to Market or through Facebook at IPTV Market. And join us again next week when we'll examine how horses are helping veterans readjust to civilian life. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.